And she took him into the, took them into the room, and he kind of stood there in the doorway, and the minister's eyes were, were closed, and he they just waited a few minutes, and finally opened his eyes, and he motioned to come over, and there was a, a chair on each side of the bed, and he, he motioned to them to sit down, so one was on one side, one on the other, and he closed his eyes again, and it was a few moments, and it was kind of a... Um, an emotional thing to be there. And finally he reached over and took each of them by the hand. Wow, this really kind of broke them. They were like, wow, we're here with him at, at, at the last. And and he they waited, he, he paused a few moments, and then finally the, the elderly minister opened his eyes and he said, gentlemen, you're probably wondering why I've asked you here. And they go, yes. Well, we, we are. This, this, this is wonderful to be here. It, it's, it's very emotional for us both, but why did you call us here? So they took, took the grip on their hands a little bit tighter. He says, all of my life, I've preached Jesus, and I've done everything I could to follow him and be like him. And so as I'm getting near the end of my life, I realized that he died between two thieves, so I wanted you with me as I go. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> resurrecting hope. So I just, I just happened to hear that. I thought that was, um, thought that was um, pretty neat. So as, so when I'm 120 and I'm getting close, and if I call some of you all in. Just make sure what's that? No, no. Okay. So last week we started looking at resurrecting hope with a message called Resurrection Hope. Because Jesus is alive, we have hope today. And even if we get to a point that seems like things are hopeless and life is hopeless, because Jesus is alive, hope can be resurrected in our lives. We just got to look to him and trust him. Today I want to share with you a story that comes from the last chapter in the Gospel of John. And the title of the message today is, Do You Love Me? Do You Love Me? And some of you probably know the story that I'm going to look at, but Do You Love Me? And as I talked about in a little intro video, so many times in how we live our lives, it's almost like we deny we know Christ. If we're not careful, We've all done that and how we lived, how we've, how we've said something, how we've acted through all that. It's almost like, Lord, I don't even know you. And he simply says, do you love me? What I want you to understand is this. No matter what we've done or where we've been or what we've gone through, he never forsakes us. At times, it seems like we've turned our backs on him. And often when we do that, you know what our first response is? We're going to run and hide. Lord, I, I can't get near you. Because that's what we do in life. When we hurt others or we deny them, the first thing, the last thing we want to do is see them in Walmart. We go around the other aisle. No, 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 no. I, I don't want to, I can't, I don't, I don't want to deal with that today. That's what we do. Notice, notice how I said that. That's what we do. I've done it. I just, I just don't want to deal with that right now. Well, for whatever reason, we do that. But he's always there to give us resurrection hope because of who he is and what he has done for us. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your love for us, that your mercy, your kindness, your goodness is, is always there. And Lord, even when we can't, even when we can't have that same type of love, Lord, you've never let us go. You keep drawing us closer so we can experience your perfect love. Lord, I pray that as we look into your word today, it'll come alive to us. And Lord, we'll see and understand exactly what you have for us. Lord, I pray for the churches around this area and across the world that, Lord, today Jesus will be real. Lord, I pray for our country and for our leaders that, Lord, they will experience your goodness. And Lord, they will take the wisdom that you give to govern and, Lord, to, to bless this nation. Lord, I pray for Christians around the world today that, Maybe going through persecution. Lord, we don't completely understand what that is like. But Lord, we just Lord trust you that, Lord, your presence and your hope will be refreshed and renewed in them. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. 
We thank you that you are our blessing. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you love me? Last week as we looked at the as the resurrection, we saw how that Mary and the ladies, they, they went to the tomb on that first Easter morning and how that when they got there, the stone was rolled away and the Jesus' body was not there. The tomb was empty. His resurrection filled her with hope and it, it changed everything. Then she, she, oh, when she encountered Jesus, she didn't realize it was him at first. And she goes, it's Jesus. When he said her name, Mary. And she realized that Jesus was alive. And following her encounter with Christ, there were others who saw him as well. And today we discover that the love of Jesus can restore our hope even after great disappointment. Now I want you to understand this. His resurrection is not a dispute. In fact, last night, I don't know if I was on Facebook or Instagram, but I happened to notice somebody was talking about the 11 disciples and how that the, the 11 of the 12, Judas hung himself, but how that 10 of the other 11, how that they died. How that they were martyred. And up until the point of their death, they never denied the fact that Jesus had resurrected. If it was a lie, why would you keep that lie and perpetuate it if it could save your life? They, they kept that. We know that he was seen by the, the apostles and by the women. We know that by 500 people saw Jesus after his resurrection. It is a fact that Jesus is alive, that he rose from the dead. His body was not in the grave. And because of that, even despite our disappointments and our denial, Jesus is still there and he loves us. And one of the greatest challenges that each one of us face in life is how to handle relationships. Learning to apologize and forgive are some of the most difficult tasks that we undertake. How many remember the TV um, um, series Happy Days? Okay. Fonzie, what was the hardest thing for him to say? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He never could get it out. I'm sorry. He never could say it. And the hardest thing for us to do a lot of times is to fess up to the fact that we've messed up and we got to apologize. When we experience brokenness between husbands and wives, between parents and children, or between friends, it robs us of the hope of what that relationship could be like. But in and through the power of Christ, we can find new hope. Now, I want to share with you today a story that comes from, from John chapter 20, but it, it, it starts with the fact that some of his closest friends denied him. They denied him at the time that he, we would say he probably needed them the most. See, in John 18, verses 15 through 17, it says this, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now, they're following him after he's been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's been arrested. They're taking him to be tried. They're following. It says, and now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not, are you not? You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Here's Peter denying the fact that he even knows Jesus. We're going to go to a, um, a passage a little bit later there. If you skip on down to the next slide, please. It says this, now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. And then it goes on and says, one of the disciples Servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off. Now, if you remember, when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter cut off the ear of one of the, uh, one of the people that came to arrest him. He cut off an ear. And I'll ask you this question. Why did he cut the ear off? Why would you pick the ear? It's because he missed the neck. Okay. Somebody heard somebody say that. He, he, he wasn't aiming for the ear. It was just a bad shot. But he cut off the ear. He said, did I not see you in the garden with him? 
Peter then denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Now, another gospel tells us that when the rooster crowed, that what happened, Jesus looked right at Peter, and Peter looked at Jesus. And it said, Peter whipped, went out and wept bitterly. Peter wept bitterly. Here's Peter, who's denied Jesus. Now, you'll notice, where are all the other disciples? They're not around. There was one other that was there, and he went in. But the rest of them weren't there either. So Jesus is basically there alone in his, his darkest time, and it's time that he was he needed him, and he was betrayed, and Peter betrayed him. After three years of ministry with Jesus, Peter refuses to remain loyal, and he denies connection to Christ. Three times, Peter says, I do not know. And there was one, one of the gospels says that Peter actually like cursed. I don't know this man. He got angry. Don't ask. I do not know him. And Peter denies. Now, I think a lot of times Peter gets a bad rap because of his brashness and his boldness. And, and we think we think about it in our lives, how many times have we basically said, I don't know him. You know, yeah, those Christian people, those people that go to church, come on now, they're a little weird. Yet you come every Sunday. I, 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 I'm, not going, I'm not going to be a part of that crowd. That's what we do so many times. Maybe it's not by words. Maybe it's by our, our actions or, or not just what we do, but maybe what we don't do. But Peter betrayed Jesus. But see, our lives show our connection to Jesus. See, maybe there's some of you sitting here today that if you look back over the last um, weeks or months or years, you can point to thoughts or words or actions that we would say might, might hurt the heart of God. Maybe it was to give some people the impression that you don't even know him. We've all been there. Listen, I, I'm standing up here today sharing this with you, and, and I've been there. I've, I've done things that I know people are like, we know what we don't know exactly him, but it, it would put me in a light that wouldn't show Christ. I know that. See, we break trust, we speak harshly, we hold hate in our heart. Unfortunately, some of the most unloving and difficult people I've come across in my life and ministry have been people within the church. Now we smile, but you know, sometimes that now I'm going to tell you what. It's no different than when you go to the workplace. But it should. It's no different than when you go to a family get-together sometimes. But it should be. See, our lives show our connection to Jesus. The author and speaker, Brandon Manning, once said, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Now notice it's very quiet in here. Nobody's just looking at me. But you know, if we're not careful, we tend to forget who we are and what he's done in our life. We must ask ourselves, what do our lives say about our connection to Christ? Go with me to John chapter 21. Now, what do we know Peter did? Peter denied him how many times? Three times. Jesus told him he was going to do it. What did Peter do? Lord, I'll never do it. No, even if they have to kill me, I'll never deny you. And what was the first thing? I don't know him. Not me. I'm not connected to that man. <laughs> you all got him. You take him. I'm not connected to him. So Peter has this denial and betrayal in his mind. And, and, and in chapter 21, it says this. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Now, what happened to the disciples? There were multiple, many of them that, that were fishermen by trade. And when Jesus called them, he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So they gave that up and they left and they followed Jesus. But when Jesus was gone, they didn't know what to do. What was the first thing they did? They went back to what they had always done. We're going fishing. 
We're going to go fishing. Verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. So they didn't know what else to do. So Peter says, I'm going fishing. They said, we're going to go fishing with you. So they went out, they fished all night in the boat. And it says that they caught nothing. See, following Peter's denial, without anything to do, they went back to what they've been doing. Because that was comfort. See, what happens when, if, if we're not careful in our lives, we tend to go towards what's comfortable, what we've always done. And Jesus had brought them out of that into something that he was preparing them for, getting them ready for it. Let's go to verse 4. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. Now, where were the disciples still? The boat. Jesus is on the shore. Notice how he called them. Children, have you any food? They answered, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Now, now let's read the next verse, and I'll make my point. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, who is that? That's John, the writer of the book, said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged in to the sea. Now, I am sure there was something about this that reminded them of the time before when Jesus said, cast your net on the other side. It's not the first time. And all of a sudden they get a, a boatload of fish, they have trouble getting it in, and then John looked and said, hey, it's the Lord. It's the Master. It's Jesus. Peter, the one who denied him, is the first one that jumps out of the boat and takes off. And then verse 8, But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. So what's, what's happened? They went back to what they knew. Why? Their master was gone. He was dead. They heard he was alive. They saw the empty tomb, but they had, there hadn't been a connection made there yet. So they said, let's go fishing. We don't, we're not sure what to do. So they're out in the boat. They fished all night. Got no fish. Finally, Jesus standing at the shore. Hey, children, you got any fish? No, we got nothing. Well, cast your net on the other side. When they did, it's full. And all of a sudden, their eyes are open. And they know that it's Jesus. So Peter jumps it out and comes in. Now, what has Peter just done several days before? I don't know him. Here's Peter saying, I gotta get to Jesus. I gotta get to Jesus. See, there, the point there for me is this: even when you've wondered, even when you've denied, even when you've betrayed, even when you've let him down, you don't need to run from Jesus because he's coming to you. You've got to go to him. And as we get to Jesus, things get better. The more we run, the worse things get. So Peter jumps into the water and comes to Jesus. He's there. And then when he gets there, you know what he's already got ready for him? Got the fire. What does it say in that, in that verse 9? As soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. I'm going to read you verse 10, and it's not up here. Jesus said, then bring some of the fish which you have just Jesus is preparing a meal for them. He's preparing a, a fellowship. Yes, I, yes, you told me that. Yes, you ran. Yes, Peter, you betrayed me. You know what? I'm here now. I'm going to bring you hope. You know, in the lowest points of our life, when we have failed, when we have messed up, and, and we've all got different things that we've failed and messed up in. Some people like to call them the skeletons in your closet. Those low points in our lives, those things that 
we don't want anybody to know about. And he says, you know, here's what you understand. He knows. He already knows. But you know what? I'm coming for you. Despite all of that, I'm coming for you. And when I do, it's not just going to be, I'm going to tell you what you did wrong and how you got to fix it. I've prepared a fire. We're going to get you warm. We're going to get you something to eat. I'm going to fellowship you because I love you. I care about you. And I want to have a relationship with you. See, Jesus' grace restores our hope. His grace restores our hope. Not his judgment. Not his punishment. It's his grace. His grace. His grace gives you what you don't deserve. It's his grace. The mercy doesn't give you what you do deserve. There were times when I was growing up, I deserved a spanking, and my dad told me I was getting one. But we prayed enough, and we were quiet enough that he didn't do it. That was mercy. Because I don't think he forgot. But I don't know that necessarily it was a God move that he stopped. I think it was just mercy. Okay, we won't. I won't get him this time. So mercy says, I'm not going to give you what you do deserve. And grace says, I'll give you what you don't deserve. See, Jesus' grace restores our hope. In a time in our life when we don't need, we, we shouldn't have any hope, he says, you know what? I'm here on the scene and I love you and I'm going to give you hope. I'm going to renew and refresh and restore that hope. See, Peter was filled, I think, with hope that a relationship could be restored. Why? Jesus came. Jesus came. Jesus had fish and a fire for pep. I, I, I am sure out on that boat all night, I'm sure it got a little chilly. When it got in that water, they got wet. So here's the fire. It's already, and the fish were cooking. They were probably hungry. They had nothing to eat. They didn't have any fish to prepare until Jesus came. See, the miracle of Easter is that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all of our broken relationships can be restored. All of our mistakes and our shortcomings can be, can be covered by God's grace. It is more than enough to fill us with hope. Again, it's sufficient for us, and it is not something we can do on our own. See, we can't do what God can do on our own. We have to trust him. He's the only one that can restore hope. He's the only one that can give us grace. It's Jesus. So as Peter arrives at the shore, there's a fire and the cook and the fish are cooking. I can imagine Jesus just, just standing there smiling. That, that, cause I, I imagine that because that's that's what my dad would have done. He, 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 would just, he would just get this little grin on his face, like, okay, good to see you. I see Jesus now just smiling at them, glad to see them. And then we're going to pick up in verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to, them, he said to, he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, be my lamb. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. Then he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This thing he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. This is a familiar passage for many of you, but Jesus said to him, Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And some have surmised that Jesus asked him three times because of the fact that Peter denied him three times. And that's, and that's um, very plausible. We don't have scriptural, scripture reference for anything like that in there. But what happened, Jesus came and simply asked, do you love me? But here's the other thing that he did. He didn't just say, do you love me? 
He followed that up with, feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. Feed my lamb. It wasn't just, Peter, I know, need to know you love, but you know what? I haven't forgotten how, what, what I want to do in you. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to do this for me. I still got a calling. So many people feel like once I failed, it's over. God can't use me. Nothing, nothing good can come of my life. All I can do is wait to go to heaven. No. He says, you know what? Do you love me? I want you to work for me. Do you love me? I want you to go and share about me. Do you love me? I want you to let other people know that even when they fail and there's no hope, it seems like you can still find hope because of me and because of my grace. See, we tend to say, well, and we, this is what we do within our human thing. Well, they failed. God's going to forget about them. Or here's what we do. When somebody has a, a moral failure and then they come back in the ministry, it's like, well, I don't know how they could do that. I know what they did. His grace restores hope. And the scripture tells us his grace is sufficient. No matter what you're going through, whether the pain, the suffering, it's his grace that is a hope. He asked him three times, do you love me? Now here, I want to share this with you about these three times. In, in the Greek, which the New Testament was written in, there's different words for different types of love. What do they call Philadelphia? The city of brotherly love. That Philadelphia, that philio, is a type of brotherly love. Agape is the greatest type of love that, that's mentioned in the Bible. There's a love that, that's for like a husband and a wife. There, there's a, a friend type of thing. And Jesus asked him the first time, do you love me? And here's what Peter said. Jesus said, Peter, do you agape love me? Do you love me with the greatest love that you have? He said, Lord, I love you. And what you know the word he used there was the filio. It's like a brother. Not the agape love. Lord, I love you on this level. Wow, what would we do if we come to somebody, you know what, I love you this much. Well, I love you down here. What would we do? Yeah, well, okay, I'm dropping my love. But you know what Jesus did the second time? Peter, do you love me? Agape. And Peter said, Lord, I love you. Helio, down here. Second time. Well, this relationship ain't going very far. Just imagine if you ask someone that you're engaged to, do you love me here? I love you here. That's not very good. You know what Jesus did a third time? Do you love me? I'm going to come to where you're at, Peter. Yes, Lord, I love you. Tend my sheep. See, he understood what was going on in Peter's life. He understands where you're at. Now, he wants our love to grow. And, our, and as, we, as we do, as we get in his word, as we go through life and we see him work, I believe our love grows. But he was saying, Peter, do you love me here? And he said, Lord, I, I, I'm here right now. And finally, he said, well, I'll take what you got. And Peter, love me. See, the grace restores the hope. Yes, we want to love him so deep and so passionately, but sometimes, you know what, things in life and where we're at, we're, we're here. He says, you know what, I'm going to meet you where you're at. You know what, and through that, we're going to grow. We can grow in love. We can grow deeper with him. We can understand more about him. But just because maybe we're not where we think we ought to be, God's not going to cast you away. He's going to say, do you love me? Take what you got. And I want it to grow. Now, Later on, what do we know about Peter's love? Oh, it was a love that it seemed to be very deep. I mean, he actually, when he, when he was crucified, he was crucified upside down. He said, I don't want to be crucified like my Lord. Turn me upside down, basically. He went to the cross knowing that he was going to die. Why? Because he loved Jesus so deeply. He was one of those disciples that said, you know what? We know that he's risen. We're not going to deny the fact that he's alive. Peter loved Jesus, and Jesus loved Peter. It was his grace 
that came. See, Peter's denial was met with restoration that came from Jesus. See, a love for Jesus is proven by our life for Jesus. Now, I want to, I want to make sure you understand what I say. Let me read a scripture with to you, and then I want to make sure we understand this. Love for Jesus is proven by life for Jesus. Let's go to the scripture, if we can. Now, by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, stop there for just a second. That's pretty tough, ain't it? How many has kept all of his commandments? Come on, there's got to be at least one. All of the commandments? He says, you know what? you got to keep them all. And you know what it says? If you don't keep them all, what does that mean? You're guilty of all of them. Well, Pastor, I've never murdered anybody. That's true. Maybe you haven't. But if you've told a lie, if I went around here and asked how many from the time you were born to this day have ever told a lie, I would bet there's very few of you that haven't told one. So, Pastor, it was just a little white lie. It actually helped them out. By me lying, I, I helped, it didn't hurt them. You know what a lie is? An untruth. Whether it's white, black, red, and blue. You know what he says? He says, if you've told, broken one, you know what you've done? You've broken them all. And here's what he says. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Oh, my gosh. Let's go to the next part of it. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. See, here's what happens. His grace saves us. And he says, you know what? I'm going to do for you what you can't do on your own. I'm going to make you right with God. I'm going to make you holy. I'm going to make you justified. I'm going to make you worthy of heaven. And so even when we fail and fail to keep the commandments, you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't throw us away. He keeps drawing us closer so that what the love of God can be perfected in us. And see, here's what happens. The world sees us. And yes, I, I, would, I, would, I would dare to say that there's not one here today that wakes up in the morning and says, you know what? Today, I want to break as many commandments as I can. Now, there may be somebody, if there is, please talk to me afterwards. We need to have prayer. <laughs> see, I, I doubt that we do that. Most of us get up and you know what? Even when the area that you're struggling, you know what? Today I'm going to do better. I'm not going to do that today. And what happens so often? We fail. And we say, well, then that means I don't love it. No, it doesn't. It means that his love is continuing to work in your life and perfect you and be perfected in your life. And he doesn't cast you away. He keeps coming and says, do you love me? Do you love me? Lord, I love you. I love you. He says, keep my commandments. See, we're called to love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But we can't do that on our own. We can only do that through grace. And because we know that he loves us. And even when I fail, he doesn't cast me away. That's why I keep coming to him. Because I know he still loves me. Now, does that mean I want to have a life that's perfect? Yeah. What are the odds of that happening? In my flesh, slim, if at best. Does that mean I'm not his child? No. It just means he's still working on me. And I need more of his grace. I need to draw closer to him. That's why I keep telling you, we need to get in the word so we know who we are and who he is in us. See, as, and as people look at us, they see our lives. And even when we fail, you know what happens? We can still point them to Jesus. We simply say, I'm sorry. You know what? I messed up. That's not who I am in Christ. I should never have done that. You know the heart. What did we say? What did we start the whole message with? The hardest thing for us to say is, I'm sorry and apologize. 
But when we know who we are in Christ, it becomes something that we can do. Why? He keeps pulling us closer. He keeps pulling us closer and he doesn't cast us away. See, that's what Adam and Eve, when they were in the garden, what was the first thing they did when they ate of the tree? They realized they were naked and they ran and hid. And then God came and said, Adam, Eve, basically, this is my paraphrase. Basically, Lord, we're over here, we're hiding. Why are you hiding? We know we're naked. Who told you you were naked? And he understood the first thing they did was hide. What's our thing that we do when we know we failed? We just want to hide, don't we? And he you know what he says to do? Come to me. But whoever keeps his word, truly love God, is perfected in him. And as we become, understand more of his love for us, you know what happens? We start to become more like him. See, it's not just in our efforts. Yes, we, we try. We do. But as we understand he loves us, we become more like him. And you know what happens? This is a term that I, I don't really use it a whole lot, but they, they say it's, they, that people like it. It becomes organic. Pastor, what do you mean by organic? It just happens. You know, we can try, and it seems like the harder we try, sometimes the more we fail. But when we just come to know him and learn to love him through the word, through our prayer time, through worshiping him and all of those things, then what happens is we get closer and we become more like him. And so our, our lives reflect Christ more in our life. And our love is proven by a life for him because we know that he loves us. So don't give up hope. His grace restores the hope in your life. His love is always there. And he simply asks, do you love me? Now remember, sometimes it's going to be very rare that our love can match his love for us. But you know what he does? He takes it. <coughs> and he grows it. And we get closer and closer to him. It's an amazing thing how that happens. <clears throat> we feel like, we're, we're, Lord, I'm not close enough to you. He goes, I'm right there with you. And I'm walking with you and drawing you to me. He loves you. He loves you. He's never going to let you go. And hope is yours because of Jesus and his grace. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your goodness to us and your love and for the fact that you never let us go. Even when we fail, even when we struggle, even, Lord, when we would deny you, Lord, you, you said you're always there. Lord, even in our best efforts, we come up short. Lord, even when we try to be perfect, we tend to fail. Because, Lord, we don't understand. Lord, if it's in the flesh, we can't. But in your power and your strength and in your grace, we can become more like you. And our love can grow deeper and deeper. Holy Spirit, I ask that you speak to each heart today. Lord, there are some here today that, Lord, they... They've lost hope because they thought they loved you on a certain level, and Lord, they failed. And Lord, they just, they'd rather hide than to come closer. Holy Spirit, draw them today. Let them know they are loved. That the creator of the universe, the God of everything, loves them and will never let them go. Even in the midst of their failure, he's going to come looking for them. Holy Spirit, speak to their hearts today. I'm going to take, I'm going to pause here for just a moment. I'm just going to let you talk to God. I'm going to let Holy Spirit talk to your life. Maybe you're here today and you failed. You felt like you could, you're not as close as you used to be. Maybe your failure has caused away. I want you to right now just talk to God. 
let him love you today and let you sense his love right now. Would you just take this time and just talk to the Lord? today and you've never made a relationship with Jesus. You've never confessed him as Lord and never confessed that you believe he rose from the dead and allowed him to take away all of the sins from your life. I want to ask you to pray with me in just a moment. I want to pray a prayer that comes straight from scripture and we're going to believe that he's going to change your life. That he's going to save you. He's going to take away your sins. He's going to make you a child of God. If you've prayed this in the past and you know that that you've been saved and he's, he's your Lord, pray it once again for those that may be praying it for the first time. And if this is the first time you've prayed this, I want you to believe it as you pray. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross and that you rose from the dead. Based on that confession, I am saved. My sins are gone. I'm a child of God. You've changed my destiny. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand right now? We're going to sing the verse of the course of this song. He is...